Hello everyone, welcome to Rural Water Resource Management, NPTEL course. This is week six, lecture five. In this current week, we have been looking at surface water storage systems for rural water resource management. We have also looked at the types and what are the issues concerning each type. In today's lecture, we would go through some of the issues and concerns and how to get out of those issues and also recap of this week's lecture. Let's start with the revival of tanks and lakes or the water bodies. In the previous lecture, we have a case study of Bangalore where we saw that water lake area has been diminishing and because of that, the agricultural farmers are driven out of the system and there is less water for domestic use because the same urban people have started polluting the water and that water is not good for urban or good for agriculture and it is a pure waste. Also, the ecological balance has been disturbed, which is the plants, animals, fish and other insects and organisms depending on the water have vanished. So it is very important to save and revive these water bodies. What do you mean by revive? Is once it's uh, polluted to a particular extent, you want to reproduce it to the, a particular level. <coughs> so it's a revival of <coughs> excuse me, the water bodies. How can we do that? Let's look at some measures. Augmentation of storage capacity. So I mentioned that if you have a check dam, a water storage device and water is coming and storing, some of the sediments are deposited on the check dam. This actually leads to a lessening of the volume and also breaking of the dam. So what you can do is you need to augment the storage, which means maintain the um, sediment uh, level, like drudge it and take it out, and also make the buns stronger. So maintenance is very important, and augmenting, adding to the storage capacity is important. Some people raise the level of the check dam. Some people will dig more deeper so that water can come and store more. So those are some measures. Desilting of tanks and feeders are very, very important, not only in the major tanks and dams, but also the feeder channels which take the water to the farm can have sediments. It has to be clean and free flowing. If you have sediment levels, then it will oppose the water movement and stop it. And also the water would flow out of the system. Let's uh, see a drawing, for example. Okay, uh, this is your channel. Okay, uh, I'm just drawing a cross section and initially water is flowing, which is fine. Slowly your sediment is building up. Okay, now what would happen is the water which was initially flowing through now would flow over because of the sediment. <coughs> and when it comes over, it comes out of the channel. And that is a loss because they want to supply from the dam to the farmer, but in between, if the water is flowing out, it is a loss. So you need to be very careful with this aspect, wherein desilting of tanks and feeders is needed. Regular upkeeping. So you always have to monitor the banks, the embankment, the check dam, etc. I'm just taking check dam, for example. If you don't do maintenance and monitoring, they will fail. So one of the uh, big ponds that were supplying water for agriculture and domestic use in um, outskirts of Chennai, the Chembrambakkam uh, Lake broke. And once it broke, the entire city of Chennai was flooded. So if it is very important to make sure the buns and monitoring, keeping on checking all these uh, infrastructure is very important. <clears throat> 
participation of farmers and revival of tanks. So uh, we cannot just wait for the government to release funds, time and labor every time to save these tanks. We're not getting into the question, is it a mandate or not? We are trying to tell sometimes there is a delay and sometimes there's no funds. So the farmers and stakeholders who are predominantly using these systems have to get together and solve it. If it was one man's problem, then it is different. You have to spend more money and time. But if it is a community problem, not my own water problem, but it is the problem for the entire village, then all the villagers can come together and work on it. So this is called the public participatory network or public government participatory because the tanks and uh, the land is owned by the government and the farmers use it and so they participate in revival of these tanks. So this is the public participation, which is very important. This creates the ownership among farmers. So if you look at this um, uh, NGO work from Dan Foundation, you could see all the local farmers getting in and digging it out, clearing the tank debris, etc. Just look at the tank walls. All have a lot of sediments, sand, like here, uneven sand. So all this has to be taken out, sediments <coughs> have to be taken out and dumped so that you can revive the tank. So, so look at all they're carrying is just the debris, the sediments and uh, out of the tank system. As I said, uh, not always you can get all these bulldozers and JCPs to come in, but farmers, if they can just quickly combine and work, they can get it out. Sometimes you can be smart in using the government funds like Mandrega. So the Mandrega money can be used for desilting of these tanks, maintaining these water bodies. So the farmers have to come together first, say, okay, let's work together. We will put our time uh, and some money uh, can come from Mandrega. And the Mandrega can be given for like uh, strengthening uh, the concrete labor. Okay, labor cost can be brought in. So this sense of um, uh, urgency for participation is starting. And a lot of uh, other villagers are learning between each other from like Kesaris from Madurai Dan, etc. And they also want to do it because you don't need a government to come and tell you to do it. You just watch them how to do and then you do it. And that is the role of NGOs and the media like YouTube, <coughs> everywhere you can see these structures being uh, managed and what activities can be done. For example, this lecture is on YouTube. So a lot of people are getting benefits. Same way, if uh, these um, monitoring networks and management revival work can be shot on YouTube and shared in the open platform, a lot of farmers can look at it and get benefits. Along with it, so now I've managed, let's say I've asked the community to manage the water body, like diesel, make the buns stronger, etc. <coughs> what is also needed is monitoring. Because you cannot manage what you cannot monitor. There's a saying uh, for water, uh, especially, you cannot manage something if you cannot monitor it. So monitoring is very important to understand what is the water coming in, supply and demand, what is the water use, and creating budgets. Detailed water budgets is necessary so that you can know who's uh, doing water thefts, who's lift irrigation without telling the community, etc. The monitoring uh, can be used, uh, done by mostly sensors, uh, electrical sensors, uh, battery operated, solar power operated, etc., which are nowadays very cheap. You can buy these uh, from the market and um, they can be used for multiple um, monitoring. One can be used for water release. For example, I have the reservoir and from the reservoir water is released. So there is a reservoir level. Uh, if you know that five hours the sluice gate was open, you can say how much the level was before and after, then you can know the volume of the water. Also, you can put meters along the channels to regularly monitor the flow discharge um, out of the structures. The irrigation canal water levels can also be monitored. Remember that the irrigation canals are like a weir, which means it forces water to flow through them. And so there's only a, a constant uh, velocity discharge that can go through. So if you know 
the engineering aspects of the canal, like a weir, if you put it in, and the height of water, you can readily calculate the discharge. Lift irrigation meters. So those pumps that are pulling the water and distributing the water uh, against gravity, those water should be monitored using meters because the lift can maybe be uh, assume that, okay, I'm going to lift and put it into a small tank and then distribute the water. While you distribute the water, there could be meters. <coughs> and more importantly, pump meters. Pump is the pumps that you use for lift irrigation and or you can use for groundwater pumping and putting it into farm ponds, etc. So these can actually give you good data about how much water you take and how much water you use. <coughs> Some of these can also be uh, estimated using proxy data. Proxy data is, for example, for the pump meter, uh, the connection, electricity connection is different for domestic use, for agricultural use. So if you know a particular farm area and a pump is only using one connection, the meter uh, and the pump efficiency can be <coughs> used <coughs> to estimate how many hours the pump ran and based on the efficiency, how many liters it was pumping. So all these can be done. What is missing is people and capacity to do it. That's put in the issues and concerns. Some people claim meters and data collection is an expensive um, uh, work. A lot of people don't do it okay, because of the cost involved, meters, etc. It is time consuming. Uh, you have to uh, set it up. You have to collect the data and then uh, lot of capacity has to be built for analysis. As I said, you can have these meters, but the meter data has to be converted to a water budget. All the units has to be normalized and that takes some capacity. <coughs> Simple budgets can be done. For example, a tank, how much water is there, how much release. So you don't need build big capacity. But for most of the other work, there is some capacity needed, training needed, and that can be done by NGOs. No real-time data is available, um, and I just showed a teaser of what can come for the real-time, but I'll come back again. So no real-time data is available, which means uh, right now, what is the water level, you know, um, in small uh, irrigation structures? It's not a big dams, maybe, and that is also sensitive data, but small structures, uh, farm ponds, we don't have because of the cost and time involved. And conversion of the data analysis to actions. Okay, who is the body that has to take care of these actions is limited. Right now, we have pushing the community farmers to take these activities and then manage water better. So the conversion from data to action is done by the community participation. So this um, real-time monitoring can be um, taken up by smart agricultural systems, and it is called Agriculture 4.0 where you use a lot of robotics, automated equipment, ICT, IoT, and IOE. ICT is the information uh, um, communication technology. IoT is Internet of Things, and IOE is Internet of Everything. So all these different uh, nameologies can be used for, or methods can be used for procuring the data at a low cost and then converting it into information for water budgets, especially for these rural surface water storage systems. Remote sensing tools can help in um, performing these uh, so-called monitoring and uh, metering activities, uh, and GIS networks can be made. Let's look at some examples for uh, monitoring lakes and tanks and water bodies. Remote sensing data, okay? So what is remote sensing? It is collecting data without touching an object. And we have here <coughs> a lot of different tools and techniques that can be used for collecting data without touching, which, are, which is by using drones, satellites, cell phones, et cetera. And they can be used for finding the causative factors, causalities of the degradation of the lakes and tanks. Hydrological models can be based on these remote sensing data, wherein results such as floods, 
water quality and quantity can be obtained and they can be used for monitoring. You can also plan for effective restoration scenarios based on the remote sensing data. <coughs> and these data <coughs> can be used for models, whereas other scenarios can be used. For example, climate change, uh, I want to convert uh, a, a lake into uh, smaller tanks, for example. Uh, those kind of scenarios can be effectively tested in a hydrological model, which is driven by remote sensing data. And then we give it back to the system. Determination of land use land cover change is very important. We need to understand how these lakes and water bodies are changing. How is the land around the water body changing? And that can be done only by proper monitoring and evaluation based on data. Since we don't have the data, we are going to use satellite data to look at how the land has changed. If you remember in the last class, I showed you an image of the Bangalore Lake. <coughs> the Bangalore Lake has evolved. Okay, So during the evolution, it has lost a lot of land for agriculture and urbanization has come up. In those days, you have to go down and do surveys. But now you can just use a satellite image and then take uh, the uh, uh, classification based on the image. The use is basically the spatial resolution and temporal resolution are very, very high, which means I can send a satellite every two weeks and then take this data. And it is really uh, less expensive because most of this data is open source free. So once you establish the land use land cover change, then alteration in runoff, sediment loading, increase in pollution can be monitored. Okay, so these determinations of LULC change, which is once you change the land, um, the, um, um, there is alteration, runoff, sediment loading, etc., can be established easily once you have the change in land cover. And also the downstream users, how they are impacted. Uh, you have a lake on top, and if you manage it improperly or, or polluted, the downstream community also faces the change. And those all can be monitored using remote sensing data. Let's see some, uh, at least one or two case studies. But before that, <coughs> please understand that these data are free and even our own Indian uh, Space Research Organization, ISRO, has multiple satellites. The satellite data is free and also very focused on these land use land cover change. Um, and mapping of water bodies. So you could quickly run some analysis, uh, at least the area, leave the volume for now, but at least the area, water spread area, if you know it is shrinking, uh, you know that it's not pushing it down. It's not like a square is being pushed as a cylinder. No, it's not. So it's just a area which is losing water uh, because the area of the water is gone. It's being encroached and the volume will also be gone because of sedimentation, etc. So as a case study, <coughs> I'm going to show you uh, a region in Dahod. And uh, the blue um, points you see is the check dams. Okay, So there have been check dams. Uh, and I'm com comparing uh, data between 1991 and 2017. So this NGO has put in these check dams, but they don't have money to um, you know, monitor them. As I said, it is expensive and also time consuming. So we use remote sensing data to look at how the land water availability has changed from 1991 to 2017. And it's very important to take the same or similar rainfall time. So you could see that the rainfall is not much different. It is 650 millimeters versus 657 millimeters. And what the study found out is very interesting. We found out that in most regions where the check dam was there, the water availability increased okay, in the land. And that is an indicator, the NDWI, uh, which is an indicator of water availability in the soil um, in that particular area 
um, shows a considerable increase from red to blue, at least in most regions. Okay. And this is purely because of the check dam and the check dam uh, has some lift irrigation which uh, lifts the water into uh, remote areas. For example, this is the river network uh, and there has been a lot of check dams and lift irrigation. From here, the water is now available to this part where in 1991, there is no availability. So even though you don't have data, these kind of remote sensing methods can help in assessing the benefits of these uh, structures and also putting water budgets which can be used for further management. But a quick question is, is monitoring alone enough? So for example, I'm, I'm doing water monitoring through in remote sensing. I'm putting a satellite to monitor <coughs> where the water is being used, how much water is being used, etc. Is that alone enough? No. As I clearly explained in the previous slide, you need to collect data to understand the water budget. But after that, you have to create new monitoring plans and management plans so that sustainably the water can be used. And for that, there is a lot of hydrological models that are driven by these remote sensing data or observation data. One such model is called the SWOT which is the soil and water assessment tool. And you could see that the SWOT actually is a very sophisticated model. Uh, most importantly, it sets up the hydrological uh, condition for your study area, and it gives multiple scenarios that you could use for using the water. Let's take some example. So first, what you'll do is you can model <coughs> the <coughs> lake tank how much water comes into the lake because the surface runoff is mon monitored and modeled using the SWOT model. You give a land use land cover and the SWOT model converts your land use uh, cover into a runoff coefficient. So now I know how much rainfall is happening. Of that rainfall, how much water is coming into the lakes and stuff. It is a very interdisciplinary watershed tool. It's not only for soil, it is not only for water. Uh, it is integrating all these uh, multiple disciplines into one uh, tool. And it helps to predict short and long-term impacts uh, of these uh, management practices or conversions. Yes, it basically does rainfall and runoff, but it also looks at sediment loading. So once I convert rainfall into runoff, uh, the runoff uh, can pick up sediments. So I can look at sediment loading. And uh, the water quality modeling can also be done because once the sediment is done, the movement of fertilizers, et cetera, pollution, uh, sewage, uh, if you have to give data, then it can model how it moves from one place to the other. It can also be used for assessment of point and non-point uh, pollutions and climate change scenarios. Most importantly, uh, the different climate change model data can be given and management scenarios can be made. So this is a very important application of this SWOT model. It not only stops in creating an understanding of the water budget, which is by converting rainfall into runoff and compartmentalizing different water uses. It also includes climate change for the future predictions on how the hydrology will change. It doesn't stop there. You can also give scenarios, which means, for example, I can say, okay, I don't want to grow sugarcane. I want to grow different crop. How will the water balance? Be. So those are the scenarios, management scenarios that you can put in the model before you ask the farmers to do it. So uh, with this, uh, we have come to the end of week six, uh, looking at surface water storage systems in rural areas. I'll do a quick recap of week six. Um, we looked at the different water structures uh, present in uh, the rural setting starting from lakes, tanks, ponds, and how water are being stored, even big dams. We then looked at the uh, access uh, of water from these sources. Uh, there's direct access where you have a big uh, 
channel bringing the water from these dams or reservoirs to your location. Um, there is indirect access by which you have one direct access to the village and from there you take water to your own um, farmland. Uh, so those kind of things are coming under the irrigation schemes. The irrigation schemes can be divided further into gravity versus lift, whereas gravity just is basically the water when you open the gate, it flows down into your farm because of gravity that you don't have to spend energy to bring the water down. Whereas lift irrigation is a very particular scheme which is used to pump the water from uh, the uh, main channel to locations which are not connected by the channels. It has been very beneficial, especially for highly undulating areas where undulation is present, change in elevation, and the water body is present very low in the elevation, whereas the land is present very high. So water is being pushed <coughs> or pumped from that location, low elevation location to a higher location using different energy sources. We also looked at issues and concerns, both in the last and this class, especially the water theft um, and water fights. Again, water theft is not only in rural areas. A uh, lot of people have predicted the next war would come because of water wars. You could see uh, countries, transboundary countries, always fighting for water. For example, um, in the African regions, the countries have to sign pact uh, for using the Nile water, right? Uh, and there's always some issues and um, uh, protections put for the water concerns. In fact, the Kaveri, even not even national, but even the uh, within the national, I'm saying, uh, you have issues like the Kaveri water issue, which has been one of the oldest water issue in the world in, in terms of law and still not resolved. So because of that, there's a lot of water theft. Okay, so that is one thing. And also people don't get access. People are greedy. They want to grow cash crops rather than small crops with small water demand. Then there is a lot of water thefts happening. And then you have urbanization and conversion. Whereas the land around the lake is being first converted into urban. And slowly the encroachment happens into the water bodies and the water bodies are also converted into urban. If you go to Bangalore and Chennai, you would see a lot of land uh, or, or areas named after a water body because initially it was a water body. For example, Velacheri. Velacheri was the name of the water body that was present in that area. And that was drained. And once it got drained, the land uh, was dried and then the construction happened. So all this is kind of your water threat theft because you have taken it out and now it is a water threat. Those people don't have good access to drinking water. They buy the water from far away and that is also not sustainable. What are the ways out? Um, there are multiple ways uh, that we used uh, to see in this lecture. One is communal use, coming together as a group rather than individually um, maintaining or managing the water. You combine together as a farmer uh, group, for example, and look at what is the demand for all the farmers, not only one farmer. And then you take a collective decision on the water budget, how much water to be stored, how much water to be used. <coughs> so the first is communal use and communal monitoring, evaluation, and revival. So the tank revival is based on community participation. Then you have remote sensing, monitoring, and evaluations where data, if you don't have data, you still can use the freely available satellite uh, and drone data for monitoring and evaluating your water bodies. And evaluation and management is a key. You cannot just have water levels. It has to be converted to an evaluation of how much water is there and how much um, can be stored. And those uh, have to be converted to a management plan. These are not new. For example, the Kalane Dam uh, or Anaikat is one of the oldest water body serving still now. 
it was not built by the Britishers, it was built by uh, the Cholan King Karikalan. And um, it still stands and does its duty of storing the water, diverting the water, etc. So all this is not new. What we have done is we have not picked up the traditional knowledge and we have abused the system. For example, urbanization, I'm saying without looking into the water demand. So all this has to be retapped, reworked, and then go back to traditional knowledge on how these water bodies are, are managed and uh, also uh, look at new technologies and solutions to manage water better. With this, uh, I am concluding the surface uh, water storage system lecture for rural water resource management. In the future lectures, we will look at some case studies and how to come out of these uh, issues collectively. Thank you.